This is All India Radio. In the program Spotlight, now we bring you a discussion on India-Japan relations in view of Japan Prime Minister Kishida Fumio's visit to India. The participants are Deepa Gopalan Vadhva, India's former ambassador to Japan, and Simran Sodhi, journalist. Today we are discussing the visit of the Japanese Prime Minister to India. The Japanese Prime Minister met our Prime Minister Narendra Modi in the morning. Both held wide-ranging talks and various issues were discussed. Japanese Prime Minister also addressed and delivered the Sapru House lecture and he mentioned the Indo-Pacific and its importance in the relationship. Ambassador Vadba, how significant is this visit as he comes to India, especially in light of the fact that India is currently holding the G20 presidency and Japan the G7 presidency? Several reasons why this is very important. First, the fact that he has made the visit uh, to India to discuss both bilateral relations as well as our respective G20 and G7 priorities and agendas. As you know that India and Japan are, they have assumed the presidencies of these two very important bodies. And the third thing I think is that he used New Delhi as the platform to launch his own vision of the uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. So on, you know, on many counts, this has been a very important visit. Mr. Vadla, we also see that in his lecture that he, the 41st Sapru House lecture that he has delivered today, he has spoken and he has said that India is an indispensable partner. And I believe India and Japan are in an extremely unique position in the current international relations and further in the history of the world. How do you see this India-Japan relationship coming together and of course, the unspoken element in the room is China. Let's just look at the intrinsic strength of our bilateral relationship, which is now a special strategic and global partnership. So what we do is work with each other. We have a lot of complementarities in terms of our political systems, our democracies, in terms of our economic interests, in terms of our security interests. There's a lot of complementarities. So we come together in a very sort of multi-layered architecture of cooperation and dialogue that both countries are there together. That is one part of it. The other thing is that India and Japan work together on regional and global issues. And when you look at regional issues, you certainly are looking at India and Japan working together in the Indo-Pacific. And in that context, the importance, of course, of FOIP, the free and open Indo-Pacific vision. Uh, why was this necessitated? Uh, this was necessitated by certainly, among other things, our own uh, interests, our security, our economic interests, and also the um, challenges posed by changes in the balance of power and changes of new uh, countries in the sense who believe in power projection, perhaps without really abiding by the rule of law which holds the countries together. So which is why China is perhaps certainly an area of concern which is not particularly mentioned but we do understand that we have come together so that we can have a more predictable world where we work according to the rule of law. Ambassador Vadva, we also see that the Ukraine conflict is also uh, one of the issues on table and the Japanese Prime Minister, he today condemned the Russian offensive against Ukraine. He also said that Prime Minister Narendra Modi also told the Russian President Vladimir Putin that today's era is not of war. And he also said that the international community has entered an era in which cooperation and division are intricately intertwined. How do you see Japan's viewpoint on the Ukraine conflict? And we also have India's own perspective on this conflict. Do you think this is an area where both will ultimately respect each other's perspective? Or how do you think this works into the relationship? When we had Prime Minister Kishida's first visit to India last year, soon after he became Prime Minister, you know, for our annual summit, there was a joint statement that was issued between the two countries. And that shows the convergences on this issue. Certainly, it is an issue which is a challenge to global peace. There's no doubt about that. Our Prime Minister, as you mentioned, has said this is not an era of war. We, India, has been advocating very strongly the need for dialogue to come to the table and resolve this conflict. All conflicts have to be resolved and countries must come together and be able to work together to be able to resolve these conflicts. 
our position is very clear. What the West, perhaps with sanctions and outright condemnation in the words that they want to be used, perhaps is not the line that India and several other countries have chosen because we have our own interests, we have our own histories, we have our own perspectives. What I feel is that Japan has come around to understand this. That you know we have our own perspective, and you find this in this speech that he gave today at Sapro House. He did talk about diversity now in the world, and that everybody has their own you know differences, their own perspectives, but that there are some basic minimum principles that everybody should agree to. And I think these are principles that none of us have any problems with. That is respect for sovereignty, respect for territorial integrity. That you should not use. Force uh, unilaterally to change uh, status quo. I mean, these are principles I think uh, with which India would have no problem. One of the forums or one of the groupings in which both India and Japan are partners, and we've seen. Um, I'm referring to the Quad, which has grown in strength in the recent years. Quad is also a forum where we see uh, four like-minded nations coming together. Again, the Indo-Pacific is, of course, the uh, the important element there. But do you feel that the Quad is another forum, which one brings India and Japan together, and which maybe also gives them an opportunity to develop a common perspective on the world today? Yes, indeed it is because I think Quad really brings together four like-minded countries. We are four democracies. We again believe in common. There are some common principles that we believe in as. Being democracies, which is you know the rule of law, the fact that we uh, can uh, need to work together on the critical issues and the critical challenges of our times, and so the court does give us a platform where we can discuss these issues. And as you know, that it has graduated now to where we have very focused cooperation within the court countries. Court countries are countries with a common perspective, but we also are working in a court plus format where we also incorporate other countries. To work with us on key issues, as we did when it came to the whole issue of the COVID vaccine, where we all work together. I think whether it's Indo-Pacific or the Quad, as far as India is concerned, I think it's very important to be inclusive. That there are other countries which have common interests, we're quite happy to work with them. But certainly, we four Quad countries who form the Quad do work together because we have many common points. In terms of the way we look at the, the regional security environment, the way we look at changes around the globe, and the way we look at other challenges of our times, as I mentioned earlier, just environmental protection, climate change, uh, cyberspace, and so on. Best of all, one aspect of the relationship is also the economic partnership. And in his remarks today, the Japanese Prime Minister said that Japan will continue to invest in India's development story, which will not only benefit New Delhi but Tokyo as well. And last year, during his visit to India, he had announced an investment target of five trillion yen into India over the next five years. How do you see the economic aspect of this relationship panning out in the near future? The economic aspect of the relationship is extremely important. Japan is a country we look. To for not only our development cooperation projects, and you know they have been involved in many of our very important projects in India, whether it's a dedicated freight corridor, whether it's a high speed rail, whether it's metros, with the development of infrastructure. So I think Japan, over time, and not only uh, in the recent years, has been a very reliable and important partner for us. But I think what we do want to see is、um, a deepening of this relationship, particularly in terms of FDI and more. Japanese companies coming into India and investing. I think this is very important. And yes,、uh, if you look at development cooperation projects that、uh, Japan has, whether it's a high-speed rail or any of the other projects that are there, it is a win-win for both. Because very often you find Japanese companies who are involved in the execution of these projects, and therefore is beneficial to Japan as well. Mr. Vadna, we also see that the Japanese Prime Minister has written in one of India's、uh, national dailies, and he has also referred in his article about the cooperation that is needed between the G70 and the G20. He has specifically said that in order to respond effectively to the various challenges that the international community is currently facing, cooperation between the G7 and the G20 has greater significance. Such pressing challenges include food security, climate and energy, fair and transparent development finance. How do you、uh, see India and Japan then cooperating in these factors, climate change and、uh, environment, as we push forward? Also, we have seen Japan taking a lot of interest and in investing in the northeast of India. 
several questions there in your question. So one certainly is since both countries have assumed presidencies of the G20 and G7 respectively, we have set our own priorities as presidents for these bodies. And these are, I think, what we would like to have perhaps happened was that the two prime ministers talked and explained their respective priorities as they had this dialogue, the bilateral dialogue today. Certainly, that that was area that they would have covered and they would have looked at, you know, the common challenges where they can see where there are spaces where we can work together. And you mentioned climate change, global health. These are areas certainly where there are converging possibilities of cooperation bilaterally and with other countries. So that is one part of it. The other part of it, of course, question of the Northeast. Yes, the Northeast last year, when uh, Prime Minister Kishida came, there was an agreement signed between India and Japan to develop the Northeast, the economic development of the Northeast. So I think Northeast is an area where both countries do work together. And uh, Japan is really looking at beyond the Northeast, at not only development of the Northeast, but also connectivity beyond to ASEAN and through Bangladesh to the Bay of Bengal. And uh, you know, they're coinciding interests uh, between our two countries in these kind of projects. Mashtabadwa, we see that the Japanese Prime Minister, he has also been visiting and meeting international leaders starting January this year when he traveled to the US, Canada, UK, France and Italy. He has also hosted the German Chancellor in Tokyo and uh, the agenda has basically been discussing with these member countries the G7 agenda. There are a lot of analysts who feel that his trip to Delhi, one of the main things that he wants to do is to bring India on board so that more tough language can be used on Russia during the Hiroshima G7 meeting. Something that, you know, India didn't sign on during last year's G7 summit, which took place in Germany. Do you feel that this is Japan pushing it? How do you see India then reacting to it? See, first of all, in G7 summit in Hiroshima, we are a special invitee. Most of the G7 countries perhaps have a common position insofar as the conflict in Ukraine is concerned. And they could would be able to strengthen not only condemnation of Russia, but also you know, sanctions, which they're very keen on, sanctions against Russia. So, I mean, there is very clearly that is what their agenda is. Now, can they force the hands of anybody, India included, to be totally in sync with them? I don't think that is going to be a possibility. And there's a reality that they have realized themselves that that is not going to be possible. So, we will be there at the G7 summit. Their position, perhaps, on uh, Ukraine, there will be some kind of difference from uh, what the line that a lot of other countries are taking. So while being there, just being there will not mean an endorsement of the position of G7. But as far as India is concerned, we made it very clear. We have our own national interest, number one. Number two, we certainly do not want this war to, to prolong because it's affecting the whole world economically and you can't ignore that. And three, nobody can really any umbrage at what we're saying is that, you know, we certainly have to see this process ending or seeing an, being brought to an end through dialogue among all the parties concerned. Ambassador Vadva, we also see that the Japanese Prime Minister will visit the Buddha Jayanti Park in the capital along with Prime Minister Modi and see the Baal Bodhi tree, which is believed to be connected to the Mahabodhi tree that Lord Buddha attained enlightenment under. How do you see Buddhism then connecting India and Japan as what we call the cultural diplomacy or the soft diplomacy part of it? It's a reality. Buddhism does connect India and Japan. There's no two ways about it. So we feel that we are geographically so far apart. I mean, Buddhism did reach Japan as early as the 7th century. And of course, it went through intermediaries such as uh, China and Korea, but they were Indian monks. In fact, there was a particular Indian monk called Bodhisena who took Buddhism to Japan. And this is recognized. Everybody that you know in Japan, they do recognize the contribution of India, of Lord Buddha, and that that's a very special link between us. And you'll really be surprised when you're there that, I mean, how many places you confront without even realizing this very, very close connection between our two countries. And I think visit to the Buddha Jayanti Park was perhaps an opportunity for our prime ministers to kind of reiterate and, you know, re-emphasize that connect between our two countries, which is you know, beyond this religion. It's also values, you know, it's value systems. It's the way one looks at the world. There's a lot more that binds us at a very basic level through Buddhism. And in the coming days, we will continue our discussions on the India-Japan relationship and the various facets to it. With these comments, we bring today's discussion to an end. Thank you. Thank you very much. You were listening to a discussion on India-Japan relations in view of Japan Prime Minister Kishida Fumio's visit to India. The participants were Deepa Gopalan Vadhva, 
India's former ambassador to Japan and Simran Sodhi, journalist. This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of All India Radio.